I personally do believe that this is an important uh, subject that we are about to call and discuss. And I do definitely think that uh, uh, it is uh, important from the Indian perspective and to acquaint us with uh, a variety of views. We have a fairly uh, diverse panel. I'm sure there will be different views here. Uh, I'll introduce them one by one as they are asked to speak. But before that, a small uh, sort of aside. Some of the issues that I would like my colleagues to highlight are uh, about what the next five years are likely to hold, five, six years are likely to hold for Russia. Russia is going to the polls, as you all know, in March. I think uh, the result, I mean, uh, very few people have any doubt about uh, the result. Uh, and therefore, we come to the question of Russia has emerged in the past two, three years as a very strong geostrategic player, in whether it's in West Asia, whether it's in Afghanistan, various other places. Uh, for example, even today, if you look at the uh, uh, crisis in North Korea, Russia is uh, clearly one of the players which will be involved in its resolution. On the other hand, there has always been a lot of talk about how the Russian economy is over-dependent on export of natural resources, so therefore it is susceptible to sudden changes in commodity prices, and that there is a need for the Russian economy to diversify. And if that is the case, if there is actually, I'm not an economist, but if there is a need for the Russian economy to diversify, how is that going to be achieved? And in, when we discuss how it's going to be achieved, there are controversial views. Some suggest that it would require a certain amount of uh, privatization and you need to uh, move towards diversification through that route. There are others who suggest that maybe that is not uh, necessary, that uh, if you uh, follow a state capitalist model, maybe even further consolidation creating these huge public sector behemoths may be actually the path towards increased growth. Either way, we uh, understand that experts on both sides agree that some kind of reform and diversification of the Russian economy is, has to be undertaken. So the challenge now to my uh, colleagues is this, and this is what we had discussed earlier also. I'm going to give literally about a couple of minutes to each one of them to, in bullet points, put forth their uh, understanding of what the next five, six years holds for Russia. Uh, at the end of that, once everyone's views are expressed, we will have a discussion among some of them because I'm sure there will be some controversial issues. And in the end, I will give 15 minutes for a discussion with the floor. If at that stage, consumption of alcohol permits a reasonable discussion. So I would like to start with uh, Sasha Gobuev, since Samir said that if he is here, provocation is not far away. So, Sasha. Thank you so much. I didn't take enough my, of my medicine to be super provocative, but I try to warm everybody up, and you will have a wonderful intellectual dessert by my colleague and friend, uh, Timofey Berdachev, at the very end of this panel. Uh, bullet points. Uh, I think that the, the major takeaway I want you to make is that current Russia's successes, or what appears to be success, is exactly the root of the future failure of the country and of the system in general. Uh, point number one, people say that Mr. Putin comes with a re-election, which is a sure and clear re-election uh, March this year, and it's going to be structural reforms. So he has six years, and it's going to be an energized effort to change the country. Um, I'm 32, but even I'm fed up with conversation about structural reforms in the next political cycle in Russia. It doesn't end up, doesn't happen. Uh, with all the 18 years with Mr. Putin in power, structural reform doesn't really happen much unless the beginning of his very first term. Uh, the reason for that is that the country is prosperous and successful enough to keep the system afloat 
and to kick the can down the road for indefinite times. You don't need to reform. Everything is fine. You look at his approval rating, you look at what Russia can be doing militarily around the world, the economic base is here. To unlock the potential of creativity of the Russian people requires giving them a lot of rights, creating independent judiciary and decreasing the role of the system or the state. Uh, that's not in the cards for Russia. So for six years, you can tolerate 2% growth, which is well below the global average. But who cares? You don't mind. So you can kick the can down the road. The only reform that I expect is that in personalized regimes, a lot is about succession, as you know. You look at even Zimbabwe has to face this problem. Uh, Mr. Putin is young enough, very energetic, can uh, ride a horse, can ride a bear, arguably, uh, or a plane, is much fitter than many leaders around the world, but he, uh, there is an expiry date even written somewhere on Mr. Putin. Uh, my prediction is that next six years will be spent on building a collective successor, grooming a group of leaders who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, who are now reshuffled between the center and the regions, and these are one-star generals promoted to two-star generals, and create a collective successor and then handpick somebody who is loyal. And that's a sort of Chinese version of tradition. Uh, that sounds to be fine. Uh, the long-term uh, challenges to that system is that the pie is shrinking. We are living unraveling technological revolution, which is challenging the means of production and stuff. A decade back, the most expensive com uh, companies used to be commodity-based companies. It used to be ExxonMobil, like oil companies. Now it's Apple, Amazon, Google, and it's no surprise. Digital revolution is unraveling, and Russia on that landscape globally is tiny little. It has some very competitive sectors and some very competitive companies, but it's definitely not enough to keep the population afloat. The population, the demographic is a good thing. The population is aging, so it's probably less youth being produced in the next two uh, decades because of the demographic echo of the Second World War. But still, the challenges are looming large. The educational system is degradating. There is continued outflow of smart Russians out of the country. So 10, 15 years, somewhere down the road, the situation doesn't look so stable. And then though the pie is shrinking, the appetites of the people around Mr. P and inside the system are definitely not shrinking. They are actually growing as happening in many systems. So if you follow Russia, the case of Mr. Igor Sechin, the head of powerful Rosneft, eating up chunk by chunk private oil companies, is something what all the Russians are looking into. On foreign policy, uh, there is enough resources to sustain this foreign policy because uh, operations in Syria, operations in Ukraine are not very, uh, not very expensive. The strategic rationale behind that is a big question. How does this influence translate into some economic benefits to Mother Russia? Question mark. You have an enemy nation now on your western flank. You have galvanized much more coherent NATO. You have sanctions which will prevent a lot of your cooperation. So you're basically stuck with friends like Bashar Assad or uh, Venezuelan regime. Hmm, I don't know how much you come forward with that. Uh, and last point, that shouldn't be taken as a big geopolitically significant thing because uh, when you are led by the hype in Western headlines that Putin is unraveling the international leader, liberal order or he is so powerful that he can push a button and the Russian hackers elect US president, that's nonsense. I think that the international liberal order never existed and it's unraveling and changing to something new because you still have in the Western country the uh, impossible combination of uh, democracy and capitalism, which is producing high-powered inequality. And this is amplified by the digital means of communication. How the Western societies manage this challenge, I don't know. Uh, but that's definitely what's happening internally and externally. The U.S. is, is le leaving many, many spaces. And that creates vacuum for players like Russia. But it's definitely going to be a very crowded landscape, and Russia will be not the dominant player. I stop here. I was about to show you that the liberal order is ended, but <clears throat> you stopped. Uh, I forgot to introduce uh, uh, Alexander Gaboyev. 
He is uh, a senior fellow and the chair of the Russia in the Asia Pacific program at the Carnegie in Moscow. <clears throat> and now, if I may request Thomas Gomart, who is the director of IFRI, the French Institute of International Relations, uh, take the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you for your invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to participate in uh, this uh, dialogue. Um, first of all, I have to, to confess that I spent a lot of my professional life to elaborate cooperation with Russia. So for this debate, I will try to take another step and maybe to be more, more critical, more provocative to try to anticipate what, is, uh, what will happen with Russia. So the question is, what about Russia in 2024? Uh, this year, certainly, Vladimir Vladimirovich will become uh, once again Prime Minister of Russia. So maybe we should also delay this, uh, this question until uh, 2030. It's just to say that, from my point of view, the political system is uh, blocked in, uh, in Russia, and that part, of, of, of course, of the, of the problem. The question, according to me, we should raise is the following. Will Russia be more connected and less sanctioned? or less connected or more sanctioned in 2024 than today. And in fact, the response to this question depends on its own decision, for sure, but also on the uh, regional uh, situation in different um, parts of the world, and also, I think, the evolution uh, of the US. I would like to argue, and once again, it's to fuel the debates uh, tonight. I would like, I would like to argue uh, uh, as follow the tonight. It is to say that, according to me, um, Russia, like uh, is a sportsman, is a doped country, uh, using drugs to some extent, and I think that um, uh, there is room for such behavior in the coming years. But it's a risky game, obviously for Russia itself but also for its uh, neighborhood. And uh, I would like to, to point out only one point on that, uh, which seems to me uh, very critical, which is the evolution of Russia regarding uh, multilateralism. Uh, in fact, we, we are in a world now multipolar. It was promoted by some countries, such as uh, Russia, but also some uh, European countries. But we are facing a weakening of multilateralism and it is partly due not only to Russia, obviously, it's also due to China, also due to the US. But Russia plays a, a role in this weakening, and that's part, I think, of our uh, joint problem. It is very visible with OSCE in Europe, and also it is very uh, visible with the evolution of the United Nations Security Council. Just me give you one, um, one figure. Uh, since 2001, Russia used its uh, veto uh, 14 times, China six times, and the US uh, twice. So it's just to say that certainly the main diplomatic asset of Russia is badly used uh, by it. And I think that's, that's something I don't understand, but I'm pretty sure that Timofey will give me some uh, explanation of that. It seems to me that Russia is uh, deteriorating uh, its main uh, diplomatic assets. And I do think that we should encourage Russia to be back to multilateralism as soon as possible. Thank you, Thomas. That was uh, interesting. I think everyone is uh, trying to provoke Timofey into saying something bombastic. But uh, I will right now give the word to Tatiana, who is the deputy chairman of the Russian Union of Youth. Thank you so much, Mr. Mediator. Moderator. Uh, so I will speak about three points for the future of the Russian Federation. And I think that this point is very important for uh, our policy, uh, firstly for international policy. Uh, we can discuss uh, too much time about uh, growing economy of BRICS country, of India, of China. But I'm sure that if Russia want to have a strong economy, Putin and new government must to fight with corruption inside of our country. It's the first problem of our, um, of our policy, and that's why we cannot organize good place for our country on the international sphere. Second point, what about I want to say? 
Um, you know, I work very too much uh, with uh, India and with China, and I can see some conflicts in policy and in economy sphere between China and India. And I'm thinking that Russia, the Russian uh, Federation can be a uh, moderator, mediator between China and India. You know that India starts to be a part of, of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And we can, we can see what China did. This country also invited Pakistan. So it's uh, meaning that uh, it's mean that uh, China don't want that uh, India start to be more stronger in Shanghai Cooperation Organization. That's why I think that Russian Indian cooperation is very strong to show how three countries, Russia, India, and China, can work together. And I hope that Russia will introduce interest of these two countries in BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Also for us, it's very interesting and a very serious question about Ukraine, Ukraine situation. I'm sure that everybody understands that if Ukraine will have a problem, Russia will have a problem also. Ukraine is our closer neighbor and if Ukraine policy will not work for Russian-Ukraine cooperation, I think that Russia will have a problem. That's why I think that we, Russian, the Russian Federation will continue to fight with the United States of America by diplomacy way. Diplomacy way, not army way. And uh, I hope that the f for future five years, Putin will organize good links between between European countries, between some Asian countries, to have a dialogue about the future of Ukraine, and uh, not, about, not only about Ukraine, about Eastern countries. And I hope that BRICS countries, Shanghai Cooperation Organization countries, will introduce this interest to have a security uh, for all these countries who have uh, problems now. And uh, of course, I hope that our economy will grow up and I hope that we will continue, we will continue fight with our corruption inside of the, our country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, very precise and interesting. And now I have the pleasure of inviting Heather Hulbert. She's the director, New Models of Policy Change in New America. Uh, Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a wonderful chance to be on a panel with this breadth of views, and, and I will start right where Tatiana left off and say that I hope very much there is indeed an opportunity to put the Ukraine situation on a track toward resolution that works for everyone involved in the next year. I worry that if there is a small window now, it will close very quickly. And one of the reasons that it will close very quickly is something else Tatiana said, which I entirely agree with, which is it seems at this point inevitable that Russia and the US will continue conflict through um, all measures short of war, as we say. And that, I think, um, and frankly, some of the unexpected, perhaps, success of um, Russia's endeavors in this arena will um, result to, um, Sasha, as you suggested, some unexpected counter results, one of which will be that not in 2018, where I think you will see US policy be pretty much as it has been, but after 2018, and particularly going perhaps into the 2020 or 2024 period, a period where it will be very even more difficult to imagine something like US-Russian agreement on a peacekeeping force for Ukraine. So I think there's a perhaps a small window this year, but which will then get smaller. And in part because of some of the trends that other folks have, have mentioned that I will spell out a little bit more, um, I think it's worth just mentioning that the, the breadth of, of Russia's renewed geopolitical role extends well outside side the Eurasian space um, with new and vigorous activity in Africa and a, a return to Cuba where, um, for better or worse, a space was opened up for Russia to return to Cuba in the past year and Russia, Russian diplomacy and Russian economy with great alacrity took advantage of it. So this um, brings me back to expand a bit on a point Sasha made that um, Russian diplomacy and Russian globalism is now very widely spread. 
And um, at the level of um, what I like to think of as discontinuous continuity, which is perhaps not creating opportunities but seizing opportunities, we can expect Russia to have plenty of bandwidth to continue to do the kinds of things that we're, that we're seeing, but not perhaps to have either the economic resources or frankly the, the diplomatic depth to turn any of that into what we heard about at dinner tonight as a, a civilizational, um, a civilization, an organized civilizational power. So um, what that sums up to for me a little bit is more of the same. Um, another point, um, Thomas, which you raised, which I think is an interesting point that I, I would frame, um, Russia practices multilateralism of choice. It's not multilateralism of the Security Council, but it's multilateralism of choice. And um, it must be said, Russia is not the only great power that practices multilateralism of choice. And um, increasingly, um, my fear is that we will see a situation where the choice is unilateralism or a la carte multilateralism. And as I said, the Russians are practicing that very ably, but they are, they are far from the only ones. Um, a last point that I think I would make is that we uh, in the West have been telling ourselves for years, um, Sasha, the thing you said to open your remarks, that in Russia's success are the seeds of its failure. And um, if, I, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard an American policymaker say that, I would be flying home first class. Um, so while I do believe that to be true for reasons that others have laid out, I see no particular reason to believe that that moment of reckoning will come in 2018 as opposed to 2019 as opposed to 2020. And what um, both those countries which are positioning themselves to benefit from closer relationships with Russia and those countries which are struggling to deal with the impact of their particular relationship with Russia um, this is not going to be just as Russia's rise was not slow, Russia's post-Cold War rise was not slow and steady, but rather discontinuous and fast. Um, the fall or the correction when there is one will similarly be discontinuous and fast, and it will come about um, either, again, because of the corruption and internal point, Tatiana, which you referenced, or because of some entirely exogenous development, because it is the nature of the kind of power that Russia has rebuilt for itself to be riding on the back of global events rather than mastering them. So I think the last point I would make is this idea that we're watching the birth of some kind of new order in any stable sense that whatever we thought of the previous global order, we had it for more than 50 years, Whatever is happening right now, this isn't a 50, this isn't the beginning of a 50 year reign that we're looking at. Thank you, Heather. Uh, and now, uh, finally, the person who everyone's been trying to provoke so far, Timofey Bardachev, who is with the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, and he is the director of the Center for Comprehensive European and international studies. But uh, apart from that, uh, I don't know if it's mentioned in the booklet, but he's also one of the main architects and uh, creative persons in the Valdai Club. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, there were not too many provocations in the previous, in the previous speeches, so I um, uh, honestly don't don't know what, what have been provoking. If Sasha was a little bit scared, I don't know by, by what, uh, but he didn't sound as brave as he always sounds. Uh, maybe be by the size of the Russian delegation. Well, <laughs> well uh, uh, there are several simple and at the same time complicated things I need to say. The tragedy of Russian foreign policy, in my view, and my private view, since I am not on the public service, is that Russia is big enough to, to not care about what the others think. But at the same time, Russia is not big enough 
to develop without the others, without integration and cooperation with the others. And this is a dilemma of the Russian external relations. So, uh, and we need to work to overcome the negative consequences of this uh, dilemma on the daily basis. The second uh, idea, uh, Russian economy uh, is not the best economy, is not the most developed economy, but it is a functioning market economy. And last four years after the beginning of the economic crisis fall, fall of the oil prices shown that Russian economy is a self-sustainable economy which can be relatively easy governed by the minimal effort of the central bank and the government and brought to the self-sustainable condition. Uh, and it has direct effects uh, to the external economic relations, for example. If we look at our relations with Europe, uh, you know, my friend, that now we have much more French investors in Russian agricultural sector than it was before Ukraine crisis. We have French and Italian cheese makers, other milk products makers coming to Russia, bringing money instead of making us buying products from you. So, and this is a great advantage which has been actually generated during the last couple of years. The other advantages, well, the generally the goals for the next couple of years, for the next presidency, perhaps this is to how to keep, how to stabilize the achievements and uh, how to limit the damage from the mistakes and from the failures. The biggest achievements, achievement during the last couple of years was the return of Russia to the global, global policy, policy stage. And it was basically done with Syria. In order to understand the significance of Syria operation for Russia, one needs to recall what was Russia 20, 25 years ago. 20, 25 years ago, Russia, though it has possessed the nuclear weapons and permanency in the United Nations Security Council, Russia was insignificant in international affairs. We could not even defend our brotherly Yugoslavia from the NATO aggression by that time. It will never happen again. So, and this is the significance for the Russian people of the new role of the, uh, of the country on the international scene. And please tell me, what is more important for the Russian president than evaluation by the Russian people? Nothing is more important. No foreign investors, no foreign governments, only the ordinary Russians are important for the Russian president. Uh, among the major failures, of course, Ukraine must be mentioned. I, th I, I belong to those who believe that Ukraine was a failure. Russia did not manage to uh, prevent Ukraine from sliding to the anti-Russian path, and then Russia needed to resort to the, uh, to the means uh, which do not help to, to recover the situation. It would, and it will take long, long time to bring Ukraine back to the frame friendly position with regard to Russia. But I believe it, we will, if we will work hard enough, we will succeed. What should be the primarily goals? First, in my view, uh, should be the goal of internal change. We still have two major problems with Russian, uh, in Russia. One is that the huge part of Russian uh, elite does not understand the new realities of the relationships between Russia and the West. Many people in Russia still believe that we can come back to the, to the business as usual, as it has been before Ukraine. So we need to develop a national consensus on the new shape of the relationships between Russia and the West and at the same time Russia and the East, that everything has changed and nothing can be brought back. Uh, second, uh, well, Russian strategic culture has many advantages. But it has one huge disadvantage, the hu in my view. The huge disadvantage is that Russians at times believe in the final solutions and in status quo settlements. So Russians should abandon their, abandon their belief in final solutions and status quo, sentence, uh, status quo decisions and settlements because our partners in the West and also in the East will never go for final solutions. Diplomacy is not about finding final solutions. Diplomacy is a process, not the end. So, and these two internal problems must be dealt with in the next years. Uh, the good news is that now Russia apparently has approached 
to uh, the national foreign policy strategy. And the name of this foreign policy strategy is the Eurasian cooperation. Why the Eurasian cooperation? Which means neither leaning on Europe nor on Asia, but developing its own international environment favorable for Russia. And the purpose of this strategy is twofold. Uh, first, the, to, make, to create around Russia the conditions, the most favorable conditions for the achievement of the national development goals. And secondly, to establish in wider Eurasia the multilateral balancing system. And in this sense, the, our relationships with countries like China, which is our strategic partner, uh, but it will never, it, it will not become in for a civil future Russian military ally because it will negatively influence the international stability in general. And of course, India is uh, one of the major contributors to the, inter, to the multilateral balancing in, and one of the possibly the most important country, India, in international uh, balancing in wider Eurasia. So, and the other goal is to develop the institutes, institutions, international institutions in Eurasia and multilateral, uh, effective multilateralism in Eurasia. Those institutes we do have now, like OSC, for example, uh, they have been perverted by our Western partners, honestly. European Union, by introducing the solidarity cause for the voting in the OSC, actually killed this institution. So now we need to make the new institutions for the Eurasian security. And quite maybe it will sound a little bit uh, naive, but I honestly don't understand why uh, the United States are the members of the OSC and China is not. Why Britain is a member of OSC and Japan is not? Why India is not a member of the multilateral organization in Eurasia, which is the most important for the uh, discussion and settlement of the local regional security issues. So we need to develop a genuinely new agenda for the effective multilateralism in Eurasia. And development of this agenda will support the achievement of the Russian national development goals. To close my short and uh, very messy uh, comments will be to say that uh, in their expression, Russia's pivot to the East. The key word is Russia. What Russia is doing internationally is for Russia, not for the international environment. Russia is first. Thank you. Thank you, Timofey. So we have had a <coughs> rich palette of first views. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask a series of specific questions to some, to our panelists, after which we can then throw it open to the floor. My first question is to Heather. Uh, Heather, you know, uh, you suggested that uh, we are going to see more of the same in terms of the hostility in US-Russia uh, relations. And, uh, we in India, for example, view this with a certain amount of concern because we feel that uh, hostility in the relations of Russia with the US, the West in general, move Russia closer and closer to uh, China. And it may be called the pivot, but there is also the possibility that Russia becomes uh, influenced to a greater degree by the Chinese, and this is a matter of great uh, concern in India. So therefore, my question to you is, is it possible at all, are there any steps possible to be undertaken to ensure at least that even if hostility is the main force in US-Russia relations, but there are some areas in which uh, cooperation can be established. After all, there are problems in the world which uh, probably transcend this hostility. Thanks, that's a great question. I would first, though, just um, dispute your premise a little bit, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll let my Russian colleagues speak for themselves, but I think um, Russia should be given credit for making its own choices about the relationship with China. And um, Russia has plenty of reasons for choosing the relationship with China. It has regardless of what the relationship with the United States is. So, um, so I would, I would, um, I would just 
modify hopes about about that. Um, the reasons I think that you will basically see a status quo in the U.S.-Russia relationship are, first, Russia's not going to stop doing what it's doing. Um, Russia's not going to stop doing what it's doing because those things are working to advance um, and in increase Russia's global footprint. So why would Russia stop? Um, and from the U.S. perspective, um, our political cycle is such that this is going to be a year where you're just not going to see much. You, you're, you, you've now, one of the um, odd and um, unexpected and perhaps undesired outcomes of the perceptions of how Russia engaged itself in US politics over the last couple of years is that um, hostility to Russia is now a defining feature of everybody who's not a Trump supporter in American politics. Um, and so that means that both for the current administration to try to, to do fence mending is very difficult and viewed with great suspicion, um, with great suspicion that spills over from the foreign policy into the domestic and fiduciary arenas in, in a way that, that foreign policy really doesn't, doesn't have the tools to deal with. And because we have congressional elections this year, it's in nobody's incentive to do anything but fight. Um, and um, people may not know who don't follow the wonder that is American politics closely these days, but um, views on Russia are almost entirely determined by partisan identity at this point. Um, and there's been an astonishing complete flip-flop over uh, the period since 2016 where traditionally, and as was true during the Cold War and after the Cold War, it had been the case that Democrats were much more friendly to Russia and Republicans much more oppositional. You've now had this just amazing flip-flop. And so it is very, very difficult to have the conversation that I think you were hoping that I would enter into and say, well, obviously we need to work with Russia on nuclear weapons. Obviously we need to work with Russia on terrorism. Obviously, um, you know, we would be better off if we and Russia were working to the same ends in Afghanistan. Obviously we would be better off, we'll certainly be better off if we're not shooting down each other's jets in Syria and on and on and on. So. The good news is that there is a certain amount of work going on on autopilot, um, the Iran deal is one example, that may yet get through the year uninterrupted, but both um, conditions in both societies, I think, make it almost impossible to see, to see a change, um, a change in the next year, and I would anticipate that after the next year it'll get worse rather than better, from the point of view of cooperative problem solving. Thank you, Heather. That was rather comprehensive. And uh, <clears throat> now to Sasha. Sasha, I have a very short question. Uh, Russia's uh, pivot to the East or to Asia, is it uh, a pivot to China? It is a pivot to China in a way. I think that Russia tries to balance this pivot. And I totally agree with Heather that Russia has many other means to do this pivot beyond uh, the state of relationship with the West. I think that on, uh, if you imagine geopolitics as a Tinder where uh, every country can find its match, uh, Russia, 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 Russia and China should swipe each other all the same direction all the time because there are many things uniting them including the democratic nature of their political systems, um, the compelling uh, nature of the mutual affinity for the, of the economies, like one is resource hungry, uh, has a lot of capital to spend overseas, has tremendous experience how to build infrastructure. Russia has natural endowment of resources, doesn't know how to build infrastructure efficiently, on time and uh, cheap. Uh, and reliable, uh, and on and on and on. Um, and, and then there is a border. So I think that our security priorities lie elsewhere. Uh, so Russia was basically stupid not to do that 20, 25 years back. And we thought that selling commodities to the West is making us glorious, and I'm sorry, more civilized and European. And uh, selling commodities to Asia is making us sort of more backward. Uh, that was the consensus view. I think that's changing now under harsh circumstances. The problem is that we are pivoting exactly at the time where 
China's growth is slowing down. China has tremendous many alternative to Russia, and uh, it's depending on Russia on very narrow subjects like sophisticated military uh, equipment, but it will get there in 10, 15 years, and so on. So the bottom line is that Russia needs China much more than China needs Russia, and that's the basic fact. And uh, the other thing is that our relationship with the U.S. are influencing our relationship with Japan, ASEAN, South Korea, India, where we say, oh, sanctions don't exist in Asia. Wrong. They do exist. And this is the basic factor uh, which every business entity is taking into consideration. And I would totally agree with Heather. It's not only Democratic Party doesn't like Russia. It's you said that all the uh, parties that are not Trump supporters, that's true for the Republicans too. All the never Trumpers uh, don't like Russia. And I think that with every next administration, our relationship with the US is gonna get worse. And if we get a new administration, which is not this, uh, uh, I don't know what, what, the, what the right term to frame it, I will refrain from commenting on the US politics, but if you get a normal, oh, organized organized administration which knows how to operate the sanctions machine the way that Obama administration knew. Uh, Russia has going to be in a very tough spot, much tougher than it is now with, with Guy who does it where, where the departments don't talk to each other and when the different rooms in one building don't talk to each other. Uh, it's going to be a very, very tough ride. I don't think that too many Russians uh, are, are anticipating that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Thomas, if I may address this question to you, you know, what, what uh, do you see? I mean, Ukraine clearly is a dividing factor in Russia's relationships with Europe. Uh, do you see any change from the current status quo? I mean, everyone is using the word status quo and Russia is pro-status quo. Then why would Russia want to change the situation in Ukraine? Well, there are some attempts to, to try to, to improve the situation on the field. There are the Minsk agreement and its implementation. There is also some, uh, another channel right now laid directly by the US and, um, and Russia. So there are some attempts on each side to try to, to find um, an exit way to this, uh, to this crisis. But what is striking to me, it is the fact that uh, Russia is facing, and not only Russia, but Russia is facing so many geopolitical challenges, you know, the uh, Obor project, uh, the vacuum created by the US, the situation in Iran, its involvement in, uh, in, in Middle East, and at the same time allocated so many uh, political resources to Crimea and Donbass. Um, I think we should remember, for instance, only two years ago, you know, Russian authorities promoted the so-called Novaya Russia, these sort of things, completely crazy things, you know, uh, in, in retrospect with all my respect for uh, the Russian authorities. Um, but uh, what, what is very important and, and very strange uh, for, for me, it is, you know, this, this gap between the the challenges for, for Russia and its uh, concrete uh, involvements. So now the question is for sure that Russia lost Ukraine. Um, I think that all of us should avoid that um, Ukraine would become a sort of black hole in, uh, in Europe. Uh, there is certainly some initiative which should be taken to try to improve the situation uh, in Ukraine, globally speaking. I must say that the next presidential election in Ukraine 2019 will be for sure uh, a field for Russian pressure. It will, be also, it will have also some impact in terms of uh, European energy security because it will be the end of the agreement, the current agreement for the gas transits. So I think that if we would like to, to prepare things and to avoid um, you know, deterioration of the situation, this election should be prepared on each side and to avoid, and, to, and especially I insist on that, to prepare the conditions for the, the, the new or the, the renewal of the uh, energy agreements. Because if it, it's not done properly and uh, right now, 
uh, I'm pretty sure that the situation will be very, very tricky in uh, 2019 with the uh, election in Ukraine. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Tatiana, if I may, the next question is to you. You mentioned the SEO and this uh, possible uh, mediating role that Russia could play between uh, India and China. Now, uh, you know, I don't think either India or China would welcome such a proposition of uh, Russia playing a mediating role. But suppose, okay, Russia does not play the mediating role. How do you see what can Russia contribute to finding convergences between all these countries to work in an institution like the SCO or even within the RIC, tri the triangular relationship there? That is question number one. Question number two, I cannot help it. I noticed that since you are working with the Russian youth. I was wondering, I mean, do you have a vision of uh, how youth can actually influence politics in these three countries? I mean, we, are, we have completely different systems. And uh, how do you see Russian youth being able to actually play a greater political role? Thank you so much for your question. Um, about Russian, China, and Indian cooperation. Uh, I agree with you that uh, now, for this year, Russia has not some uh, smart way to organize a cooperation between the three countries. But I'm sure that uh, fruitful cooperation between these countries can be, uh, can be uh, by uh, production, investment, uh, economy sphere. For example, BRICS, let's see um, some, some mechanism, some operation between BRICS countries. If we, will see, we can see that only Russia, India, and China can work very close about economy agenda, about innovation agenda. And uh, we, can, we can see that these three countries um, understand that BRICS countries can work not about policy, but much more about economy. So, and that's why we can see many initiatives of the Russian Federation uh, who organize many proposals for India about innovation and for China about innovation. Of course, we can see that some projects is, uh, have a good uh, way, but some projects is closing because of some bu budget problems, because of some policy between China and India. But I, ca I hope that after three, four years, we, can see, we will see um, <laughs> fruitful cooperation for production sphere between three countries and innovation sphere. And I hope that BRICS Bank will have will investment to these projects. Um, and of course, uh, many experts uh, uh, have a different analysis about uh, uh, India inside of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Nobody know what will happen uh, for the next summit in China, what will be held in July uh, at 2018. And we know that India uh, will organize some agenda from the Indian side to partners for Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And how I know, by secret way, that uh, India already uh, tried to organize a good dialogue between, uh, uh, between participants of, of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It means that uh, India tried to find a good way for different cooperation uh, inside of CCO with Pakistan, with uh, China. So let's see, because strategy is very interesting. And, and I hope that Mr. Narendra Modi understands that uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization is very, uh, is very um, strong organization, and they can organize cooperation inside of this uh, organization. What about second question? It's a very interesting question, because I work with youth of the Russian Federation, and I, how I told before that we have a very close links with different biggest youth organization of China and India. And uh, also uh, for the last uh, 24 years, we work with all China Youth Federation. It's the biggest huge organization of, the, of China. Uh, and every year we organize more than 65 different projects. It means that every month we send uh, 
200, 300 people from Russia to China to have an exchange program for business, for culture, for humanitarian. Uh, we work very close between our universities. It means that we have a future view about our cooperation. Uh, and also we try to organize with India, but with India we have uh, some other problems. In India, you have not one huge biggest youth organization. You have not Indian youth, um, uh, youth union. That's why we try to, um, to find an organization uh, who, who really have a political power, who really have a budget to organize big uh, international uh, projects. But uh, till today, we have uh, 10, uh, 10 agreements with different 10 uh, youth organizations of your countries, political organization and non-political. Uh, finally, I can see that when uh, we invite uh, young leaders from China and India, they have other mind. They don't want to have a conflict. They want to have a cooperation and dialogue. They have not question why China have a big problems in economy sphere with India. No, they don't ask about it. They ask how can we work and how can we show to our uh, leaders uh, about uh, different interesting projects. And also, Russian Union of Youth uh, 10 years ago organized a youth council of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And in this year, uh, it's very good news for India. India will participate Youth Council of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. When India came to CCO, firstly, uh, Indian government sent to us a letter, official letter that young leaders of India will participate this Youth Council. It's a very good way. It means that youth already want to have a cooperation. And that's, uh, that's why we need to speak not about conflicts. We need to speak and have a discussion about how can we decide these conflicts. I think like that. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you. Uh, Timofey, last question to you, and then we uh, throw it open for a discussion. And my question is very short. We all uh, can argue till the cows come home about what Putin is going to do next and everything. But tell me, what do you think will happen after Putin? <laughs> well, the president's come and go. The na Russian national interest stays. So the Putin is a defend is good defender of Russian national interest. And uh, I honestly believe, and I think myself and my colleagues will support that the after President Putin will retire from his well-deserved posi deserved position. He, uh, we will uh, be able to assure that the next leader is going to be first professional, second patriot. Thank you. That was short and sweet. So uh, we've had uh, diverse opinions here. Uh, I think uh, there is there are lots of small little insights and nuggets that all of us can savor later. But right now, as I promised, we have 15 minutes window to interact with the panel. So is there anyone who would like to ask a question or maybe make a comment? Yes, please. Sir, this is Kelly from Afghanistan. Really glad to be here. Uh, my, question, uh, my question goes to Mr. Uh, Gabayev. Uh, it was, uh, it's, uh, uh, and related to his uh, comment about the vetoes that uh, Russian made, uh, about um, actually 15 vetoes that uh, Russia used. That was Tamar. Uh, yes. I think that was Tamar's argument about the vetoes. Yeah, that was Tamar's. <laughs> no, I, 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 it's a, just a question. So we better know that nowadays, unfortunately, democracy is being used as a weapon unfortunately, the so-called democracy. It's not, uh, if you are in the favor of few, few exact countries, then you are a democratic country. If you are not, for example, uh, in the favor of them, you're not a democratic country. It's just a web being used. And my question is, uh, from po your point of view, should Russia surrender to uh, 
to the sanctions and to the leverages that is uh, that uh, mm, uh, it's going on on it, or should should it bow for those sanctions, or should it stand and do the use uh, go forth with all the, all the power that it has? What's your um, what's your preference? Which do, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer to bow just because of sanctions? and to be timid, or you prefer to be a hero and do your best and go forth with all the power? Uh, that's the choice that actually does it. One second. Oh, sure. What we'll do is we'll take a, uh, sure. two, three questions, and then we'll answer them in one go. Uh, there's the gentleman at the back there with his finger up, now three fingers up. Yes, yes, that one. Can someone get a mic to him? Uh, with difficulty. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Maxim. I'm from Ukraine, actually. I would like to make a comment. Um, Tatiana, first of all, I would disagree with you. Um, you're right to say that um, um, we're very close countries. We used to be very close countries, um, very similar cultures. Uh, but still, uh, what Russia did in Ukraine um, with the seizure of Crimea, uh, with the conflict uh, in Donbass. Uh, what it's actually what is still going on, and people keep on dying. Um, what Russia did is actually uh, pushed Ukraine towards the West. And the majority of people fully understand that this, is, this was a, just a complete violation of international law. And I'm saying this with sadness because um, I'm ethnic Russian, but I was born and live in Ukraine. And I was always uh, sort of in between. I was always uh, promoting uh, good relations but with Russia, but still Ukraine choice was and is the European integration. It's our own, own personal choice. And providing this narrative of um, close ties or protection of um, Russian speaking people um, in Ukraine as a pretext of aggression, it's just simply not buying it. No one is buying it anymore in Ukraine. I'm Russian speaking. I don't have any problems speaking Russian in Ukraine. So, I mean, if you really, if Russia really wants peace, then you need to stop supporting terrorists. You need to withdraw weaponry. You need to sit on a go at negotiation table, but not pointing out that we should discuss it with someone else, and even agree on a peacekeeping mission. Why are you blocking this initiative? Thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Timothy. My name is uh, Siddharth Patel. I'm actually from the oil and gas industry, and my question is uh, dedicated to you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Russia did not take a hit when the oil prices dropped drastically by over 70%. What I was made to read in multiple occasions is that Russia's economy contracted by around 3% simply due to that. And it's, it's always been Russia and Saudi at the top of the oil producing countries in the world. So that's been your cash cow for all these years. We, with 2025, 2030 coming around, they say that oil, price, oil demand in the world will peak by 2025, and then it's going to be downhill from there. So what is Russia going to rely on economically to go forward? Because even if they want to take this very mighty nationalist stand, they are going to need the funds to do so. And as was discussed by Alexander, things like unique and niche military technology is not going to give Russia any of the backing it needs to continue taking this chest outstand. Thank you. One last question. 
Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Janesh Kain, and I'm uh, a diplomat with the Indian government. And I had the opportunity to serve in Moscow for five years. Uh, my question is to Ms. Hulbert and uh, Mr. Gubev in particular. Uh, yeah, I just want to understand what is it, uh, what are the West's expectations uh, from Russia that would be seen as good behavior. I mean, in Mr. Gubev's word, uh, words, how can Russia be a match on Tinder for the US, for instance? <laughs> if you could kindly elaborate on that. Okay. I had said that uh, that was the final question, but it is not the final question, because my friend, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran, wants to ask a question, and I have to let him ask that question. Mr. Sajadpur, please. Thank you very much. Actually, I enjoyed the panel. I have a question on this piloting Iranian uh, deal. Uh, cop uh, I mean, I heard that uh, this Iranian deal in Russian America now is on a uh, self-piloting. I couldn't understand it, but here, uh, what, what does it mean? Uh, more elaboration on that. But furthermore, how the issue of Iranian-Russian relationship reflects in the American foreign policy and also, in, in Moscow, how Iran is looked and is it a point for negotiation with the Americans or it is a frame, uh, a structured relationship be going beyond this, let's say, American uh, policies and so on and so forth. Thank you. To whom was the last question? I mean, the whole panel can understand. And it's actually given a lot of room and power to some groups in Russia which love sanctions. Putin's friends love sanctions because they get large chunks of Russian economy. Uh, all the people in uniform love sanctions because it's going to be the medicine or the healthcare, uh, the education budget, which are cut, but not their budgets. And I think that there are many constituencies in Russia around Mr. Putin who just thrive uh, on sanctions. I think that the real choice is uh, you get sanctions for something that you did. Uh, what you did, is it smart? Is it something serving the national interest or not? And I think it doesn't serve a Russian national interest because in Ukraine, like, first you have two different parts of sanctions. You have Crimea-related sanctions, and I'm actually very supportive for some assets of Putin cronies being frozen somewhere. That's a good thing, I think. Uh, if, they, if the Americans return them to... Russia in indefinite futures when these people are not around. That's fear. Uh, so nothing bad about that. Uh, the technological sanctions and the sectorial sanctions on the financial side, that's something bad uh, which is preventing Russia from developing. But look, looking at the Ukrainian issue, Ukraine before the Maidan coup was a country with very twisted identity, torn between the East and the West, captured by the oligarchs, and it's going to be continue to be so, because we experienced Maidan revolution in 2004. The result was huge disillusionment in pro the movement. Now it's happening again, and the likely result, if you look at the Arab Spring and many other places, would be state failure, state capture, dissolution, and actually strengthening of the Russian influence there over the long term, because many Ukrainians would feel okay, we are doomed to be a country like this, or it's going to take generations for us to transform. We cannot leapfrog and move into the Western orbit. If Russia didn't size Crimea, which provided about 2 million of pro-Russian waters, if Russia didn't chop off parts of Donbass, it would be much better off. And we have this wide arsenal of escalation with a laser to a nuclear bazooka, and you go salami slicing to escalate once you need that. And what you do is to jump and push the nuclear button by sizing Crimea. That's a very stupid policy in my view, looking forward at the, at the Russian. And then on Ukraine issue, I don't think that it's gonna be fixed easily. We have now an enemy state, uh, which is because Crimea is out, part of the state, which is Russian speaking majority, is out, Russian, nationals there have a very strong Ukrainian identity and they talk how to replace Russian culture like Pushkin and other stuff with different culture because they don't want to associate with them, themselves with Russia. It's a huge problem. Russia can sustain it. Russia can live in state of hostility with Ukraine, 
but that's a 40 million strong nation on your doorstep. That's not a very good solution for Russia going forward. So the ways to address it is a, is a sophisticated and smart challenge for the next generation of Russian foreign policy thinkers and practitioners. Thank you, Alexander. And the next question, which was uh, by Maxim, I would request Tatiana to answer that. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, so it's also very, um, very important question for me between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. Uh, believe me, Maxim, my friends and my relatives live uh, in uh, Ukraine, in Kyiv region, in the different regions of the Ukraine. Uh, what can I say? Uh, let's um, let's try to remember about uh, this no natural revolution. What was hel what was the support by United States of America against of Yanukovych? Uh, you remember that uh, was big propaganda and bad news against of Russia that it's Russia organized this revolution. But I hope that everybody understood that uh, we did not want it. Of course, we can organize a big discussion now because it's not for five or ten minutes to discuss about it. Um, I'm already thinking that, uh, yes, Russia had uh, some problems in Ukraine and we made uh, some mistakes between our policy. Um, what about uh, the negotiation between our officials? You remember that we a few years ago we signed the uh, uh, Minsk agreement, and uh, I think that you know that uh, Ukraine many times uh, uh, violated uh, these agreements. It means that they crushed these agreements, and uh, nobody did not want to uh, ex explain why Ukraine did it. And uh, of course, it's big discussion, and I'm ready to have a discussion with you. But for example, I'm deputy chairman of the Russian Union of Youth. We sent too many letters to the different youth organization of the Ukraine. And uh, what did they answer me by the non-official uh, token? The Tatiana, we are ready to work with Russian Union of Youth because uh, you are not a political organization. But our Ministry for the Foreign Affairs not agree with us that we start to uh, organize comfortable negotiation between youth of the two of the two uh, countries. So you know it's many questions. I am agree that Russia lost Ukraine now, and I can see that even youth want to organize cooperation and negotiation, but government stop these initiatives. So many questions about it, and uh, I'm. Always I open to discuss by not official and let's see what we can do by humanitarian sphere, by public diplomacy sphere. Let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Heather, there was a set of questions from my friend Sajad Poor for you. Yes, and it's a perfect follow on actually because um, there's been a lot of discussion in Russian media, which I think is very fair that Americans have tended to blame much of what um, has gone um, interestingly in our politics in the last couple of years on Russia. And the point is made that Russia is not really that all powerful and um, we got ourselves in that mess ourselves. And um, Tatiana, I really think you have to apply the same standard to Ukraine. And it's very flattering to imagine that the United States could have organized and pulled off the Maidan, except of course it's not flattering at all to the Ukrainian youth who are the ones who did it. Um, and that leads me to the question over here about what is it that the West wants? Um, and the way, the way that we really started um, spiraling down the way, to your point, we got here with the sanctions was a series of actions by Russia, which I know Russia perceives differently, but which the West perceives as infringement on the sovereignty of independent nations. And so the West wants to see that stopped wants to see the destabilizing of sovereign nations, whether it's sending um, trained paramilitaries to Bosnia or whether it's some of what's happened in Syria to stop. Um, then there is also the matter of the perception of intervention in domestic politics. Um, as it happens, I live in a state where a new candidate jumped into my local Senate race 
this past week and before 24 hours had gone by, there were thousands of Russian bots supporting her candidacy. And um, as a voter, I find that rather tiresome. Um, so I think there is, and the, the, the very sad irony about all this is that um, the American public overall was trending in a direction that was for a variety of reasons, actually quite comfortable with the idea of Russia regaining a larger geopolitical space. And there was not um, a year ago, well, no, sorry, two years ago, four <laughs> years ago, there was not the kind of broad public opposition to a resurgent global Russia that, that there is now. Um, on the point of Russia, Iran, and the US, um, something that this administration, this current administration is very consistent about in, in all of its wings is a very strong feeling of enmity toward Iran and the view that Iran is at the root of all of the security problems in the Middle East. And so therefore, Russia's um, desire to, to maintain its client state relationship with Ron, Iran and even more its uh, dependence on Iran to maintain some aspects of its role in Syria pose a serious problem for Washington which was able to be minimized as long as you had ISIS in between and all sides either actually were fighting ISIS or could say that they were fighting ISIS. But now that that is gone, that is an area of tension that will, that will increase and be difficult to manage in the new year. And it will be less and less offset by the continuing shared interest that the US and Russia have in Iran not having a nuclear weapons program. That is an interest I think we continue to share. Um, I'll grant you the United States gives mixed signals about it. But um, that interest will seem less and less paramount the more each side perceives its goals in the region blocked by the other's actions vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Can I have the two fingers on the on the what can cure the Just US Russia relations? Just one sec, one uh, We have to wind up, so I need to give Timofey to because, because I'm an, I answering the same question, what can cure U.S.-Russia okay, relationship? Okay, okay. And it's two things. One is 9-11 type of incident on steroids, something really big, a, a challenge big enough that unites the country and they can forget about all the past differences. And uh, second thing is a real transition in Russia not the change of faces, not Putin handpicks his private guard and appoints him president, but something really big, and that's perhaps not enough. So 9-11 steroids would be my answer. Okay, now uh, we are winding up with two questions that were asked to Timafe. One was on energy, and I would also like to uh, get you to answer Sajatpur's question on is Iran a bargaining chip in the relationship between Russia and the U.S.? Well, I'm very sorry, but I don't think that I'm in a position and in professional capability to answer the question of our distinguished Iranian colleague. <laughs> uh, well, I look at the Iran from the absolutely different perspective as a potential free trade area partner for the Eurasian Economic Union <coughs> and eventually Russia. So for me, the perspective is quite different. But before I answer the question on uh, energy, uh, on Ukraine again. I mean, this issue is very hot. People are, keep, are dying, and this is a terrible tragedy. I would disagree with the statement that Russia lost Ukraine. Uh, because even by saying that Russia lost Ukraine, our Ukrainian friends, I would underline, recognize that they are not lost yet, that they still want to, dis to talk to us and they still want to have this question discussed. If something lost, it is lost. It's like in uh, love relationships. It's, if it's gone, it's gone. You never call again and say, why you lost me? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, and second, uh, analytically, in international relations, nothing is lost forever. If you lose something, if you fail in something, you can always get it back or you can change the situation, you can recover. So this is not the end, this is a process. So I don't think that Russia lost Ukraine and think this there is hypocrisy. 
uh, when we say this, both on the Russian side and on the Ukrainian side. So on energy, what is Russia going to do when the energy prices might eventually, hypothetic, very hypothetically, fall down completely in 2025? Well, uh, this is a good question, an interesting one, as our British friends say. Uh, so I think that, first of all, this is still very hypothetically. Second, I can respond to you uh, from my personal perspective. I direct an analytical institute within the huge Russian university, and annually my institute does about 10, 12 projects for the government. And most of these projects are about how to remove non-tariff barriers in foreign countries for the Russian products, for Russian agricultural and other products. I, we study your market in India, we study market in Southeast Asia, in China, in Japan, everywhere. Because we want to make sure when the situation with commodity prices will change, we will not have only Chinese gas market, but we will also be able to export our manufactured and agricultural products to your markets. And this is our everyday business. So this will be my answer to your question. But you have the last word. Thank you very much. I will try to respond to your question, sir, about uh, what does uh, the West um, intend and uh, by focusing on the, on the EU. First, the EU, regarding Russia, obviously, uh, first, the EU uh, doesn't want uh, annexation on the continent. Second, uh, the EU doesn't want strategic intimidation coming from uh, Russia. And third, uh, the EU respects uh, Russia and would like to be respected uh, as a democratic system uh, by Russia right now. So let me elaborate on that because I think that the evolution of the Russian authorities is, uh, is telling. During the Yeltsin years, Ru Russia was taught about democracy, uh, especially by the EU. Uh, during Putin the first, uh, Russia elaborated its specificity. During Putin the second, Russia elaborated its uh, concept of a sovereign country. During Putin the third, uh, Russia supported political forces within uh, the EU against democracy and against the European project. And I think uh, I do hope, and I think we all hope that during uh, Putin the fourth, uh, Russia will moderate itself. Well, now that we have to wind up, we have to clear the room. I would uh, hope that we are all suitably enlightened and uh, we now know how to resolve all problems that are related to Russia. Uh, I uh, must admit that I found some of the comments fascinating. Uh, but unfortunately, presumably, I'm a bit dense, so uh, there is not much enlightenment that dawned on me. But you all look much brighter than me, so I'm sure you'll be able to, afterwards in discussions, explain to me exactly what transpired here. And now let's give them all a big hand.